cave near my house in Texas. Uh, it's called Natural Bridge Caverns. It was there recently. It's a living cave. I just thought that was kind of interesting. This is not a cave. This is a case I saw several years ago. I should comment that SIG means signalment, CC means chief complaint, HPI is history of present illness or chronology, and PE is physical. This is an 11-year-old male castrated mixed breed Labrador that had a chief complaint of a chronic cough. Started about a week ago. Now, the reason we got involved is while the veterinarian was working up the cough, uh, they found low albumin on routine blood work. So they sent the dog to A&M because they figured the albumin probably didn't have much to do with the cough. Now, as you can imagine, we did some blood work and lo and behold, yes, you know, we found the low albumin. Uh, also found li elevated liver enzymes. So we kept doing more lab tests. Uh, the CVC was boring, it was essentially normal. The urinalysis was boring, it was essentially normal. The bile acids were up, but I mean, yeah, you know, less than twice normal. That's, yeah, they're up, but, you know, not exciting. And the abdominal ultrasound looked perfectly normal. Now, let's just assume for a minute that this case came into your practice. In a second, we're going to vote, not just yet, but in a second. And I'm going to give you five options. What would you think is most appropriate? to repeat the lab work in two to three months to see what's happening, to measure the blood ammonia, to do a fine needle aspirate of the liver, to do a laparoscopic biopsy of the liver, or to treat with s adenosyl l methionine silicon, and ursodiol. First, let's go back and review the case. So an 11-year-old dog with a cough, that, and by the way, the cough's going away, the dog's feeling better, but they find abnormal lab work, just a low albumin. Oops, wrong way. Uh, here's the panel. I'll let you look at it. And then, after this, the CBC, the urinalysis, the ultrasound are boring, and the bile acids are not boring, but not exciting. And here are your options. Uh, if it's possible to vote, please go ahead and vote, and just decide what you would do next. And I take it now I need to wait until there's some indication of what the voting is. Let me, I'll, I'll tell you right now, in the United States, in the United States, I guarantee you, the two top choices would be number one and number five. Without any doubt, the two top choices would be number one and number five. Now, let's think about that for a second. Now, first place, why do clients bring animals to veterinarians in the first place? They bring cl uh, cl animals to the veterinarian because they want something fixed or prevented. That's it, right? They either want to prevent something bad from happening or they want to fix something bad that is happening. Now let's think about this philosophically for a second. What goes wrong with that? Why is it that we can't fix things? Or why is it that we don't fix things? I think there are three possible reasons. Oops, hang on a second. Let's see. Something happened here. Here we go. Number one is you've got the wrong diagnosis. Another possibility is you've got the right diagnosis, but you're using the wrong treatment. And the third possibility is you've got the right diagnosis, the right treatment, but you've got the wrong client. They won't listen to you. Now think about it for a second. When things are going wrong, what do you tend to gravitate to? Now I can tell you right now, in the United States, the number one thing that people gravitate to is the treatment. Evidently, I need a bigger drug, a newer drug, a more expensive drug, a sexier drug or something. And there's this propensity that when something goes wrong, people grab for the, near, the newest drug. Respectfully, I would say it's like this. Most of the time, and by most of the time, I would say 90 to 95 percent of the time, the problem is the diagnosis. Either you didn't diagnose the correct disease or you didn't diagnose all the diseases. If, you're, you know, if, you're, if you have therapeutic failure, by that I mean either you can't fix the animal's illness or you can't prevent its illness, 90 to 95 percent of the time it's the diagnosis. That's the diagnosis. Now let's go back to this case. In this case we have a dog with liver disease. Uh, let's, I'm going to back up here for just a second. We've got a dog with liver disease. Even though it doesn't show any, it, the dog looks like it's pretty healthy. It had a cough, who knows, something mild. 
it's got liver disease, and the trouble is that we know that there's only one way, we can see here we see the very elevated liver enzyme, there's only one way we're going to diagnose liver disease. There's only one way. You're going to have to get a piece of tissue. And what it boils down to is this. Is it cost effective or practical to biopsy the liver of a completely asymptomatic animal just because it has abnormal blood work? Now again, I don't know what's going to happen in the United Kingdom, but I bet it's similar to what happens in the U.S. Most people will say, oh, no way, man. I don't, no, 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 that isn't practical. Well, I'd like to come to you as somebody who not only has been in university practice, but also in private practice. I want to start arguing that liver biopsies, when done at the right time and in the right way, are extraordinarily cost effective, extraordinarily practical, and make all the difference in the world. For example, this dog, we biopsy the liver and we find severe chronic hepatitis and early fibrosis and scarring and cirrhosis. In fact, now this is actually the dog's biopsy. And what I want you to do right up here is like an island of normal hepatocytes <clears throat> surrounded by an, an ocean, a sea of fibrosis and inflammation. I mean, when you look at this, you wonder how the dog's alive, and yet the dog's acting normal. You see, the problem in veterinary medicine is that God made dogs tough. Okay, they made, he made them very tough. They're not wimpy like human beings. And so consequently, you know, a lot of times if you wait until they're showing signs, that can be too late. Let's talk about chronic hepatitis. This is the perfect example. Chronic hepatitis is more a syndrome than a disease. It is chronic non-septic inflammatory disease, which has many different causes. It's had a lot of names over the years, like chronic active hepatitis. They just call it chronic hepatitis. Now, what you need to know is this. Number one, yes, there are some breed predispositions, such as the Doberman, such as Cocker, but the bottom line is that every single solitary dog whether it's purebred, mixed bred, all bred, or what, can have chronic hepatitis. Now, if we talk about chronic hepatitis, let's talk about clinical signs. Now, you tell me, what type of clinical signs would you expect with chronic hepatitis? Well, in fact, most people will say, well, Mike, I would expect chronic illness. Now, this slide is my subtle nonverbal signal about what I think is likely and what is unlikely. You'll note the chronic illness is in very small print because, frankly, most dogs with chronic hepatitis do not present to the veterinarian as having chronic illness. They can, but most don't. The two most common presentations are, number one, an asymptomatic dog, which is just fortuitously found to have bad stuff on blood work, or acute illness. Now let's talk about the acute illness. Now remember, the problem we deal with is that God made dogs tough. So number one, they compensate well. You know this. I mean, if you were as tough as a Labrador, you'd make Superman look like a kid in a sandbox. These dogs are tough. And so many times they compensate and compensate until something else pops, in on, pops on them, like you know, maybe a rickettsial disease or who knows what, you know, name anything. And all of a sudden, they decompensate. So in fact, a lot of times the signs of chronic hepatitis are not chronic illness. They can be, but these are the two major presentations that we see. This is what we're most likely to see. Now the other point to remember is there is absolutely one way and one way only to biopsy this and that is with biopsy. There's only one way you're going to get a diagnosis. You have got to biopsy. There is no blood test. There is no imaging. There's no nothing that substitutes for biopsy. Now if you do biopsy, here's some of the magic words. Lymphoplasmacytic. That's a bad magic word. Piecemeal necrosis. These are things that we oftentimes hear about in chronic hepatitis. There might be a few neutrophils, but neutrophils are not predominant. Uh, sometimes you're going to start seeing <coughs> excuse me, some necrosis and fibrosis going on, depending upon how long it's been going on. Now let's go back to the word chronic, because this is where we get into trouble. Now think about it. When, when you hear about a dog or a human or whatever having chronic illness, does this tend to cause you to be at ease or nervous? I think in most cases people kind of calm down. They say, well, it's chronic. You know, I've got some time. Mm, not necessarily. Let, let, let's talk about this. There's a real problem with chronic diseases, especially in dogs. This is a case I saw many years ago. <clears throat> this is a, I think this was about a four or five-year-old female Doberman Pinscher. 
one year ago on routine wellness exam, 